Welcome to Square Notes, the sacred music podcast. Your chance to learn about the teachings of the Catholic Church on sacred music, both in theory and practice, through interviews, discussions, and music. Your hearts and minds will be lifted up and better understand what it means to sing the praise of His glory. And now, your host, Dr. Jennifer Donaldson Novitska. Hello, listeners, and welcome to Square Notes, the sacred music podcast. One of our favorite guests is back today, Professor Charles Weber from the Juilliard School, and I take a deep dive into an issue that is always sure to spark debates when two or more singers of Gregorian chant gather together. He's currently finishing up a dissertation on the approach to rhythm in Gregorian chant of Dom André Macaro, and we discuss some fundamental questions related to the so-called classical solemn performance practice style Macaro established and we tackle some of the pitfalls and misconceptions surrounding the method. If you're interested in this topic, I can recommend three classes we're offering this summer at the Catholic Institute of Sacred Music. Professor Weaver will teach an advanced seminar in Gregorian chant covering the topic of rhythm in Gregorian chant on the mornings of July 3rd to the 7th, 2023. He'll be discussing Makro and other schools of interpretation there, but also the big philosophical questions surrounding rhythm and notation generally. In the afternoons that same week, I'll teach an advanced seminar and chant focusing on chronomy or conducting the chant using Makro's method. And if you haven't already taken Introduction to Gregorian Chant or you need a refresher course before going on to these advanced seminars, I'll be teaching Intro to Gregorian Chant the week before, June 26th through the 30th. Our application for the summer program is now available on our website, catholicinstituteofsacredmusic.org. This summer features free tuition and affordable room and board for those studying in person. We've also got a helpful FAQ for you to learn more about the courses and the whole program, catholicinstituteofsacredmusic.org. And now on to the interview. Charlie, I think this is the third or fourth time that you've been on the show. Um, So you're a frequent flyer here. Welcome back. Thanks for having me. So today we are going to discuss the Gregorian chant theory, method, ideas of Dom André Macaro. And um, this is a a topic that both you and I have talked about a lot and that we we have definite views about. (laughs) I want to take the opportunity, since you're working on your dissertation on this topic, to discuss it in a a, a rather dispassionate way and make some um, intellectual discoveries here about Macro, what he really thinks, and then we can talk about some of the practical stuff. So I don't want to start with a biography of Macro, since I think that it's our shared perspective that while any question about Macro's work needs a historical and biographical perspective to explain it, but that questions he deals with are too substantive to be totally relegated to a contextualization that makes him into a simply a man of his time thus dismissing his intellectual and musical project altogether. So let's instead begin with a question about what questions Makaro seemed to think it was important to answer. What do you think those questions were? If you look at his big magnum opus, the Number Musical Gregorian, the things he starts with are very broad questions like what is music? What is rhythm? What is the nature of music in its relationship to the other fine arts music is an art of time it's a dynamic art which means that it's made up of movement and it's kind of governing ethos is rhythm which is the ordering of that movement that's a classical definition which makro takes over and then when you apply these things to chant the questions he asks are essentially how does the rhythm of chant relate to movement? And in particular, how does it relate to the nooms and how does it relate to the words? How do we experience this rhythm? What is its nature? How does movement work? What does it mean to have movement within rhythm? And those are all pretty deep kind of abiding questions. And when you approach Macro from that framework, a lot of the kind of nitty gritty questions about how the Quilisma should be interpreted or how the Salikus is interpreted become really rather marginal to his main project, which is figuring out 
how Gregorian melodies work. Right. So when I've read, you know, those first uh, chapters of the Nombre Musical Gregorian, it seems like the way he's asking questions almost is an attempt to contribute in the same way, substantively, like someone like St. Augustine or St. Thomas is aiming at. But it has the added bonus of it having some real specificity and experiential meat because it is ultimately for Makaro completely embedded in the lived experience of chant. Could you summarize perhaps some of these ways or these insights that Makaro has into the experience of chant mediating time? The way the monks of Salem experience chant and sing the chant is something that I think it's really helpful to see in continuity right from the beginning of the modern reestablishment of the monastery by Dom Guéranger some 40 years before Mokro arrived there. One of the things that the monks did very early on as part of their project of liturgical restoration was to rethink how the chant melody should work. In particular, the way chanting had been done before Guéranger was considered very heavy, very metered. You can look at books of chant accompaniment from this time, and each note of the plain chant is thought of as a half note or a whole note, and they're harmonized kind of in the way of chorales or hymns, where each note gets a new harmony. You can imagine this being a very kind of slow and ponderous approach to the chant. Any aspect of the chant relating to words or the way the words connect with accent just disappears. And so Guéranger has the insight that it has to be the words that govern the experience of chant from the beginning. It has to be a rhetorical way of making the text present to the congregation in an uplifting way. So the early writings about chant that come out of Salem, particularly the books by Dom Potier, but even before that by Canon Gontier, who was not a monk of Salem, but was a close friend of Salem, really established this rhetorical approach where the experience of the chant is governed by the words and the stress of the words and the natural rhythm of the words. Now, when Mokro arrives, he systematizes this in a rather detailed way, which, of course, has opened him up to some criticism from other chant practitioners. But it really is, as you say, grounded in the experience of chant in the daily cycle of the chant and the yearly cycle of the liturgy as it was lived at Solem in the 19th century with this constant feeling of it is the words and the rhythm of the words that is governing the way the melodies work. And Makro makes some very specific researches into how that actually translates into music, so that the rhythm of the chant is essentially dictated by the nature of accentuation in Latin. That's something that he shares with his his earlier fellow monks of Salem, Guéranger and Potier, but he creates this almost scientific cataloging of the way this works. And that's basically what his book is about. Right. So I'd like to come back to accentuation in just a moment, but maybe we could start with something about Makaro's theory of the greater rhythm you know, um, as a sort of encompassing way of expounding upon this relationship between words and music. And, you know, when I've tried to explain this to people, I like an architectural analogy. It's like the building of a cathedral facade. You can look at the individual stones, you have masonry binding them together. You engineer those stones and masonry into a complete column, and that column articulates with another column through an archway. Archways are frequently decorated, so they have both load-bearing function, and then you have that decorative element. Anyway, the whole thing is built up into an overall facade with its various load-bearing and decorative sorts of functions. Maybe you have a, a, a different way that you like thinking about the greater rhythm or a way that you could perhaps summarize 
Macro's sense of this greater rhythm, the big picture. The analogy you use of stones and architecture is interesting. And I, I think if we were to carry that analogy into the realm of language, we would have to think that the individual syllables of the Latin words are stones, which is to say, as Macro likes to say, they're dead. They're just dead things. They have no life in them. He's drawing here on some early Christian medieval writers about Latin. But the idea is that when the syllables are gathered into words, they're sort of animated in a way, animated in the sense of anima or soul. The soul of the word is the accent. And the nature of the Latin accent is something that, that has been controversial because it's a dead language. But the idea is that the syllables are gathered into the word and unified by this animating spirit of the word, which is the accent. And the greater rhythm, the big picture, is the way the words relate to each other. So when you speak a sentence, especially in an oratorical context, you don't give all the words equal emphasis. One word becomes usually the focus of the sentence. We would call that, you know, perhaps grammatical stress or oratorical stress, where we we want to draw the listener's focus to one particular word or one particular moment. And for Macro, this relates to the nature of the Gregorian melody itself. So the greater rhythm unifies the entire chant just the way that the accent unifies a single Latin word. And so all of a, a chant can be seen as approaching its main accent, its main point of emphasis, and then departing from it. And that approach and departure within the context of the free rhythm as it was practiced at Solem means that you have great flexibility in terms of dynamics, in terms of tempo, as you approach the the high point and leap from it. And the architecture, just to go back to the architecture idea for a second, we can think of this often in the form of an arch, and of course a Romanesque arch, because the chant is much older than the Gothic style. So a smooth Romanesque arch, which approaches its high point and then departs from it in this smooth, rounded, beautiful way. And in the same way, the greater rhythm means that we approach the high point by speeding up, by getting louder, and by kind of building in energy. And then as we move away from it, it's as though we're reluctant to leave the accent. And that this sense, this kind of governing sense of dynamic and rhythmic shape is what unifies the chant and makes it not just a series of words, not just a bunch of individual atomized things or nooms, but a piece that has coherence and unity. Let's get into the weeds a little bit now. You know, this area of accentuation is, as you mentioned, often a, a stumbling block for people to find this theory useful, helpful, or historically viable. So could you describe for us some of the basics of what Makaro sees in the accentuation of words and how his being a native French speaker might have or might not have had anything to do with that? That last question is so interesting and so thorny because it is a, a way that people have criticized the classic Salem method for a long time. Oh, it's just a bunch of French speakers. I find that a little too pat and not really a, a great approach, especially because when you are engaging with a particular theory in something that's controversial, like the nature of Gregorian chant rhythm, you really have to take your opposing author at his or her word and engage with their the best form of their arguments. So for Macro, he did not believe that his native 
French speaking had any influence on his understanding of Latin rhythm. And he consciously tried to get away from it. Now, with that being said, there is an element of rhythmic experience that I think all of us relate to our native language, right? Even before we're born, we hear our mother speaking in a particular language. Babies born to English speaking parents might have a different kind of mapping of the brain in relationship to rhythm than a baby born in China or for that matter in France. So leaving aside the, the question of whether maybe Macro's kind of entire conception of rhythm is based on his Frenchness, which may very well be true. He really tries to make a systematic study of the Latin accent. What is the nature of the Latin accent? In particular, he thinks about accent or the phenomenon of accent as being in three dimensions that I'll talk about. He actually says it's four, but we'll focus on three. So one is that you can accent a syllable with length. One is that you can accent it with intensity, which means to pronounce it louder than the other syllables. And one is to accent it tonically. So the tonic accent would mean that you actually pronounce it higher than the others. So to take an individual Latin word like salvator, for macro, you can sort of look at the way this should be pronounced in terms of these three dimensions. So one idea might be, well, we should make the accented syllable, which is the va, the second syllable, we should make it longer. We should pronounce it salvator or something like that. We could also just do it with intensity. We could pronounce it louder, salvator. Or we can pronounce it higher, salvator. And it's this last one that Macro says is the true Latin accent. He has a lot of foundation for that claim in the ancient grammarians' writings themselves. And in the name accent, which derives from ad cantus, or in order to sing, you might think. So the accented syllable is and should be pronounced higher than the others. Salvator is the proper way to accentuate that word. Now, the step that Macro takes beyond that is to say, when that word is set in plain chant, the composers in the 7th or 8th centuries, or whenever it was, being aware of this nature of the Latin tonic accent, use that as their kind of guiding way to set the word. So that more likely than not, it's going to be said as salvator rather than salvator, because the first of those has a uh, quality of elevating the, the tonic accent and therefore, the entire shape of the word melodically is governed by this accent pattern. So that that's sort of the big idea of Macro's thesis. And if you read the Lieber regularly and, and sing chant, I think we all can kind of agree that this does happen an awful lot of the time. So let's talk now about how that word accent interacts with the larger picture of the pneumatic shape or even a little bit bigger, um, a, a particular phrase. Again, a, a constant criticism of Macro's method is a, a complaint about how his sense of musical rhythm somehow overtakes the textual rhythm. And um, that once you start getting into neumes and, and musical phrases in Macro, that it somehow is uh, diminishing the role of the text or somehow ignorant uh, of how it deals with the text in music. Yeah, I think a lot of that criticism comes from taking some very particular statements of both Dom Mokro and Dom Gajard out of context. Both of those writers frequently say that in Gregorian chant, music always trumps the words. Which, if you're thinking from a 
word's first point of view, we think, aha, they've decided to create this bizarre system and just ignore the the plain sense of the text. I think a more fair reading of that statement is to think of it in terms of just what you were saying, getting from thinking about the individual word to thinking about the phrase. And in particular, the melodic shape of each individual word is not governed by the musical setting of the tonic accent. In other words, not every word is going to be set with a tonic accent on the high note. You get all kinds of variety in Gregorian chant, obviously. So while there is a lot of correlation between the tonic accent and the setting of the words themselves, the variety means that sometimes a word will be set kind of the wrong way round. And that phenomenon is what Macro and Gajard are describing when they say that music trumps the words, because they're thinking in terms of a larger phrase pointing toward a particular accent. So each little unit within the solemn way of thinking about chant, right? So, so a chant is made up of phrases. The phrases are made up of members, just meaning parts of the phrase. And sometimes the members are divided into what the French call incises, which we could think of as sections. These are the things that are set off in the modern editions by the quarter bars and the half bars and the full bars. So within each of those units, the idea is that there is a single accent which functions something like the way the tonic accent functions in a Latin word when you pronounce it. In other words, there's there's always a high point at every level. So an individual phrase is going to have one note or one group of notes that's higher than the others. And this is the thing that you're going to go towards and away from the way that you would when you're pronouncing a Latin word, go towards the tonic accent, go away from it. That's the whole idea. So you take this approach of of building the rhythmic energy towards the high point and away from the high point and then this is the sense of of music kind of governing the phrase structure within the nature of the latin tonic accent but kind of in this big way i admit that it's a very creative way of thinking about it and I can see that it has left Macro open to some criticism because of its sort of lack of basis in particular writings about chant. But it also is just experientially a very effective way to organize your thoughts about a chant. Essentially, just following the melodic contour often produces pretty good results for us chant practitioners. Yeah, that's a great point about the experience. And then, you know... Everything that we were talking about earlier with these philosophical things seems to be just that fruit of trying to make sense of that experience. Let's talk about the elephant in the room, which are the twos and threes. <laughs> so it seems to me a common mistake to simply boil down Macaro's method to this, forgetting things like the greater rhythm, this, these things that you're talking about, the accent, the overall structure. And then to approach the ictus as an accent, making the whole thing really pretty lumpy, or at least setting up the possibility of accusing the method of producing lumpiness. These twos and threes are, of course, denoted in Makaro's uh, work by the use of an ictus. Some of them are written in the actual Salem editions. Other of them are mental demarcations. It brings up the whole question of what is an ictus? Such a great question. An ictus is not an accent. The ictus is not an accent. The accent is not an ictus. The ictus is the downbeat of this rhythmic motion. All rhythmic motion is thought of in Mokro's terms as rise and fall. The Greek words for those, arsis and thesis, lifting up and placing down. Now, I think a lot of people who reject the Salem system agree that 
motion is made up of rise and fall. That's because you can't put a foot down until you've lifted it up. So the experience of rhythm is lifting up your hand and putting it down or lifting up your foot and putting it down when you move, when you walk, because after all, we're ordering motion. And when you dance, you have to you have to lift up, you have to jump up before you can land. So the ictus is the landing point of the smallest rhythmic motions. So the kind of basic building blocks of Macro's system are rise and fall on very, very local level levels, meaning in particular, two or three notes. Why two or three? Macro based this idea on psychological research that was being carried out by some of his contemporaries. It's actually fairly widely agreed, I would say, among musical scholars that twos and threes are rather basic building blocks. I think if you're talking specifically about Western music, there's no question that two and three are kind of the basic rhythmic frameworks on which all Western music is based. Because when you think about what a measure of four beats is, it's almost impossible to explain it in any way other than two measures of two beats, which are themselves organized in some higher fashion. So if two or three as kind of basic groups are a psychological given, which Macro thought they were, then the way they are organized in motion so that they're not just a, an endless series of meaningless dead notes, the way they're organized is as a rise and a fall. So every two notes contains a rise and a fall, not necessarily in a cartoonish way. It doesn't have to be strong, but we think of each group of two as having a motion towards its arrival. And the arrival point is what's marked by the ictus. It's just a downbeat. One problem here is that when you try to think in an intelligent or clear way about what a downbeat is, you run into all kinds of problems. There's one way we teach it to kids when we teach, say, piano lessons. That's probably different from the way that we teach it to undergraduates when we go over rhythm in music theory classes. It's different from how we talk about rhythm at a high level when we perform or when we're rehearsing with other people. And it's different from how we might talk about rhythm in a graduate seminar on the theory of rhythm. So no one really agrees about what these things are. But if you can think about if you can sort of turn around the usual way that we think about it, maybe since the time we were kids, where the downbeat comes first and the upbeat comes second. And we have this kind of march of one, two, one, two, one, two. And instead, turn it around so that we think of the motions as crossing the bar lines and ending on the downbeats. Two, one, two, one, two, one. That's the basic idea. And those ones are the ictus. Macro shared this idea with many other people in the 19th century. There was a great divide, you might say, in the theory of rhythm between those who wanted to think of the downbeat as the beginning of things and those who, like Macro, thought of the downbeat as the ending of motions. In particular, the two scholars that he maybe has most in common with were the French composer, pedagogue Vincent Dendy and the German theorist polymath Hugo Riemann. And all three of these scholars, Macro, Riemann, Dendy, believed very firmly that motion in rhythm was oriented towards arriving at a point. And for Macro, this this happens to be the marked in chant 
by the ictus mark. So the ictus is the downbeat. It's the arrival of the smallest possible rhythmic motion. And I think I've summarized it in, in a way that Marco would agree with, but it has been such a point of contention, I would say primarily because we also don't agree about what motion is or what downbeats are in general. Right. So let's talk a little bit about more, more about motion, because when you start studying uh, Marco and you are, you know, going through and marking these ictuses, whatever, very dutifully. Then when you think about the relationship of one ictus to another, you know, this going towards things, um, those ictuses, the, the points also can be origination points because sometimes they propel the energy forward and sometimes they end the energy like you're talking about. So it is even a higher differentiation between those two once you've got more than one ictus that you're talking about. Yeah, I think that maybe the best way into thinking about this is to to compare words where the accent is on the penultimate syllable and words where the accent is on the antepenultimate syllable. We have fancy terms for those. Some people describe them using poetic feet. So those would be spondees on the one hand or dactyls on the other. Some people use the the kind of more precise technical language of peroxytones for words that have this, the accent on the penult and properoxytones for words that have accent on the antipenult. And but that's a lot of kind of yeah, maybe we could get, maybe we could specify a lot of terminology. It. So I'm just going to try to stick to a concrete example. So in a word like Roma, the accent is on the first syllable, which also happens to be the penult, the second syllable from the end. So the ictus would typically fall on the ma. And you could imagine this rhythmic motion where you pronounce the word Roma. It's the placing down of the motion on the ma. And the motion has a rise and a fall. The first syllable is the rise, which means, of course, it's on the upbeat. And the second syllable is the fall, which means that it's on the downbeat. Roma. But then in a word where the accent is on the third syllable from the end, like dominus, we kind of take the the kind of two note grouping thing seriously. And that means that the first syllable is aiming towards the arrival on the nous, dominus. But it also is itself an ictus because of this kind of almost universal grouping in twos. Just to clarify what I mean by that, we said before twos and threes, it's really mostly twos. I think all of us know that the groups of three, if you're kind of following the macro system, are, are relatively rare animals. So in a word like dominus, the word itself is oriented towards the nous, but it also begins on an ictus, dominus. And that has a kind of different character from a word like Roma, where the accented syllable is on the arsis. So this is this idea of compound rhythm or composite rhythm, depending on your translation, where the syllable do is both an ictus, but it's also in the sense of the word, part of the upbeat moving towards the final arrival on nous, which means that it's a an ictus marking in the larger scheme of things an arsis or an upbeat motion. I think there's also the counter argument that a blithe or lazy approach to implementing Makaro and this emphasis on twos and threes, you know, when you're learning it, it's kind of dominating your experience of putting the, together the chant as a singer or a conductor, that it has the potential, even if it's not what Makaro intended, and it should be understood in this fuller context that you're talking about, it still has the potential to destroy the chant. <laughs> so what would you say to someone who um, rejects Makaro's system simply because they feel like it in practice makes it really lumpy. I just haven't experienced that that much. I, I've 
I've heard in many places, I've just heard chanting that isn't the Makro system, even if people are singing from the Makro editions. I feel like we have to, again, separate the best examples of something, like, for instance, the recordings by the monks of Fongombo, or I would also say that the two recent CDs by the Institute of Christ the King Sovereign Priest, which are excellent examples of the Solem method in practice. We have to separate that from the way it might work in a parish where the singers haven't even read the Liber Uzuali's introduction and don't really know what the ictus is. You know, it, it's a criticism based on faulty examples of a rhythmic system, which is probably a, a fairly weak form of argument. I will say that I I completely understand the the aversion. I have to say that I had an aversion to what I thought of as backwards rhythm for the first few years that I was singing this way. And as you become more attuned to it, it becomes maybe more a second nature and something very beautiful. But as for it not working in practice, I just think results vary. There's so many different ways that one might ruin the chant. It happens all the time, I'm afraid. So, <laughs> and and it's not only the Salem system that, that is capable of, of ruining chant, I would say. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess the other aspect of that argument too, and this is one that guides my experience in putting together, you know, structures and programs and things that my lived experience is that the Salem method is very practical. Um, and by here, I, Salem method, of course, I mean, uh, the classical Salem macro method um, is very practical in teaching a wide variety and capability level of students. And that it, it easily produces beautiful results. Do you think there is something inherent to well, I mean, obviously, Makaro thought it was inherency, right? That that's his main argument. It's not from necessarily he he tries to make the historical argument, and you know that is a, a bigger topic, perhaps, than we have time right now for. But going back to these philosophical things, right? Explaining of the experience and that inherency of the psychological experience of music through time seems to be embedded in this situation in the system in a particular way that does essentially make it very practical and usable. Yeah, it has a very definite rhythm. It's easy to learn. It can be learned by children, it can be learned by adults. It can be the subject of a lifetime of study without exhausting all of its possibilities and nuances and richness. And its ease is I would say something that makes it more practical in say a parish setting than some of the other options i mean you have to compare it to other ways you might approach chant one would be the various semiological methods where you are basing your rhythmic interpretation on still within the kind of solemn family right but in in terms of thinking about things oratorically and as driven by the words but with lots of rhythmic nuance dictated by reading the St. Gall and the Laon Nooms. This is a system that I've used when I'm singing by myself. I often sing in maybe a more hardeen sort of way, but it is quite difficult to implement that in a parish setting where you might have people coming and going, you might have different people singing. It's not maybe as practical as the Salem method. And then on the other hand, if you just get rid of all of the method and you just present maybe the, say, the Vatican edition without the Salem rhythms, you run into the other problem, which is how do you organize it? How do you count it? How do you, you know? How do you make it musical? Like to, <laughs> yeah, and of course it, it can be musical, but you have to, Put a lot more individual work into each thing to make that happen. The Salem method has a lot of practical 
use in that that uh, people of all abilities can can I think get something out of it and can approach a chant that way. Well, thank you for uh, entertaining this topic for us. Uh, it's an important one, and um, I hope that our listeners got a lot out of this. Um, and you know, maybe <laughs> maybe we haven't convinced everyone uh, of the uh, merits uh, of the exercise of this method, but um, you've given us a lot to think about. Well, I think it's it's a method that that has, you know, it it it's it can be criticized on many fronts from a historical angle but it still is done in a lot of places which which is not insignificant in itself um and often with very beautiful results so i i'm sure i haven't convinced anyone <laughs> because the topic of gregorian rhythm is incredibly complex and difficult but uh i hope i've at least presented from a fair perspective, uh, some of the qualities of, of the macro method that I think are worth considering. So thank you very much for giving me a chance to do that. Thanks, Charlie. We hope you've enjoyed listening to Square Notes, the sacred music podcast with Dr. Jennifer donaldson Novitska. For more information about this episode, sacred music resources, or upcoming events, visit our website, at sacredmusicpodcast.com. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, or your favorite podcast app. If you enjoy our podcast, please write us a review on iTunes. This improves our iTunes ranking and helps others find out about the podcast. The music you heard at the beginning of this episode is Hec Dies by William Byrd, sung by the London Oratory Scola Cantorum Boys Choir, directed by Charles Cole from the CD Sacred Treasures of England. The music at the conclusion of this podcast is from the Prelude and Fugue in G Major, BWV 550 by Johann Sebastian Bach, performed by Jennifer Donaldson Novitska. We look forward to having you join us next time. And until then, may we sing the praise of his glory.